In October of 2017, a, a former DOD counterintelligence agent had come forward with a story. Up front now, the former Pentagon military official who ran the covert government program up until this last November, Luis Elizondo. Tell us what the purpose of the program was and what did you find? Well, we found a lot. And his story was that he was involved in an effort within the Pentagon to investigate UFOs, or what they were calling now officially, unidentified aerial phenomena. UAPs is what we call it. Uh, it comes down to some of the new infrared radar systems that we're putting on some of our new jets are detecting some things out there. We have questions. December of 2017 with the New York Times and the explosive article about a secret government Pentagon UFO program. That brought in a huge amount of, of people that were interested in this subject. And that essentially created a firestorm of publicity, not only for the individual and the program, but also put a spotlight on the Pentagon. Well, after decades of denial and secrecy and flat out lying, America's defense establishment is finally admitting some of what it knows about UFO. The purpose of the program, uh, Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, was really designed to do just that. Um, from a national security perspective, identify those things that we see, whether uh, we see them electro-optically, we see them with radar, we see them uh, as, uh, as eyewitness reports, um, through a myriad of different ways and avenues that we receive the information, and try to ascertain and determine if that information is a potential threat to national security. About a year after Elizondo came forward, a very interesting thing happened, which is pretty rare when it comes to official statements. And that is the Pentagon essentially fired a shot across the bow, so to speak, and said Luis Elizondo did not work on that effort that he said he did, which was called ATIP. The Pentagon says he never was director of the Advanced Aerial Threat Identification Program. Retired Senator Reid, who funded ATIP, came on television saying, I'm defending Lou Elizondo because I know that he is telling the truth. Reed says the UFO mystery was always the primary focus, starting with the very first meeting he had with a scientist from the Defense Intelligence Agency. The DIA released a letter from the late Senator John McCain, who'd requested all available materials from ATEP for his Armed Services Committee. Reed and McCain were from different parties, but were close. John knew what I was doing. I mean, he didn't. He didn't uh, hide the fact that he was interested also. Pressure to the Pentagon to stop lying. And he ends up with an attorney, and now he gets attacked. Uh, Daniel Sheehan, who did the Pentagon Papers and Ron Contra, uh, the Silkwood case, and many others, is now working with Luis Elizondo. The Director General of the Pentagon had been pulled in to look into complaints from Luis Elizondo at the insistence of Daniel Sheehan about him being uh, threatened with loss of his security clearance because, not because he was disclosing classified material, but because he went off the leash uh, and was not wanting to continue to say the falsehood that these were an alien threat. The To The Stars Academy people kept on telling them that they had to be presenting it uh, like it, it's a potential threat because they were trying to get Congress to have an investigation. How could this man come out, start talking openly, get all this publicity, and make these bombshell claims? And the Pentagon says, nope, none of that is true. Is the evidence not there because the Pentagon is involved in this big cover-up? Or is Elizondo embellishing what his role really was? Is he lying? Is he telling the absolute truth? The Pentagon doesn't have a great history with this topic. So how do we know who to believe? Now we're into internecine warfare that is in the Pentagon between offices, that is out in the 17 intel agencies, most famous CIA, NSA, DIA. And they are all fighting each other over this basic question. Who and when? tells at least the United States of America that we're not alone in this universe. We have never been alone in this universe. We're not dealing with 
a single op coming from above. I think we're dealing with factions that are involved in a fight. There is a faction of individuals connected to the establishment who, for their own reasons, want some level of open conversation about, of UFOs to come out. But the fact is they're dealing with a very entrenched establishment that doesn't want any of this information to come out even now. So we're not talking about a coordinated, single, monolithic uh, operation here. We're dealing with a fight. But in the same time as this controversy was brewing over here, another one began to sprout. And essentially what that controversy was, was now the politicians were getting involved. It didn't matter if Elizondo was telling the truth or not. It didn't matter if ATIP was researching UFOs or not. What the reality was, was that UFOs were real. And not, not only were they real, they were a potential threat. Military pilots were being profiled by the New York Times, by the History Channel. These men and women who were flying in our skies, who encountered technology that we, to this day, cannot explain, were now in the spotlight. You know, it's one thing if one person sees one of these objects, you're like, okay, that's crazy. When you go out there every day, and you see them, and your brothers and sisters and other squadrons are seeing them, and, you know, it's like, okay, well, this is probably some type of uh, maybe drone thing or something that they're testing out. It wasn't until someone actually saw one go in between two aircraft at a close range, probably within 150 feet, that it was starting to get worrisome. We have nothing that goes that fast and just starts climbing at will. When it gets right in front of me, it just disappears. So politicians saw that and they said, we need answers. We need to figure this out. So on one hand, the Pentagon says, hey, we never did it. On the other hand, politicians say, you better start. And so that created the effort of what's called the UAP task force. And the Corona Relief Bill that President signed last month contains a provision that hasn't gotten a lot of attention. It directs the Director of National Intelligence in consultation with the Secretary of Defense and the heads of other agencies to disclose what they know about UFOs within 180 days. When I saw that first headline in the New York Times that Marco Rubio in Florida had managed to get attacked to a COVID funding bill, and you're coming down through line items having to do with budgets, and then just th three words, advanced aerial threat. It's like a non sequitur inside of the COVID funding bill. And you're reading about a request from Congress to the Director of National uh, Intelligence and to the Secretary of Defense that they are to work in collaboration to make a reply to the people being requested by the Senate on what are advanced aerial threats? Is there a possibility of source having to do with foreign adversaries? That's what it says. Foreign adversaries could have been China, Russia, and North Korea. Foreign adversaries can also be hostile ETs. And that they had a 180 day countdown from the signature of the president on December 27th of 2020 to deliver this information to the public and the media. To essentially brief Congress and the Senate on their developments, their findings, what's the status, what are, where are we at with UAPs? Are they a threat? Are they not? Can we explain them? Can we not? And so that controversy that a lot of people have focused on, myself included, was very beneficial in the end because now it has forced an effort, forced funding to go into the coffers to try and figure out what UAPs are. And now we're seeing results. So everybody got into this 180 day countdown and I thought, the government of the United States they could make a countdown to, we are finally going to tell you the truth and we can say, we are sorry. We are sorry that we learned about extraterrestrial biological entities during World War II. We couldn't talk then. The policies continued. We apologize, but we are now going to tell you what we know about the universe that we live in. This would have been wonderful because the United States is feeling as if they don't, no one knows what our government is anymore. This could have been a chance to say, we're going to collaborate with the representatives of the people in what is supposed to be a government of, by, and for the people. 
and we will use this 180-day countdown to crack open we are not alone in this universe. Will we have the truth come out, the full truth on UFOs? Of course, I don't think anyone who really thought about that believed that. Imagine like there's this, this like complicated net that's in the bottom of this sludge and it's got rocks and stuff in it and you're trying to pull it out. You, you just can't pull it out. There's so much in there and there are forces behind the scenes that will have to be, they have got the door barred and locked and that's a door that's gonna have to be broken down and it's not gonna happen voluntarily. Like that door will not be opened by the other side voluntarily. And now the word comes out about the UAPTF report and the government is now admitting that uh, UFOs are real, we're being visited and here we go. And we are now a friend of the people and we're here to support all of this and disclosure is here. No, we've gone through 70 years of, of ridicule and conspiracy theorists and tinfoil hats and we're crazy, we're hallucinating, we're, we're mental issues, you know, and that's what the UFO community has been portrayed as. And suddenly they're our friend. What we saw was a report that played this down to such an extent. They didn't even say national security threat. They wouldn't use the word threat. They called it a national security challenge. That's a sign that what we're still seeing is an attempt to play this down to the max. If it is decided that this is a threat, then what happens to the close encounter witnesses? Are we associated with a hostile foreign power? What is our legal position then? Uh, going back to like the Brookings report, we know that this type of information can have a destabilizing effect on, on culture, on religions and everything. So you understand why they would withhold it. But at the same time, it's also up to the individual to get motivated and to start to figure this out for themselves as well. Who wants a government telling us what to do about everything and what to believe about UFOs and extraterrestrials? I don't. So. This is the part of the motivation that this report has provided is, is, is the individual can now go out and seek those answers. One of the biggest things to emerge from the UAP task force and the report that they recently produced, which although was a letdown, Essentially what that produces for someone like me is what I call FOIA fodder. I often visualize the Freedom of Information Act and when you utilize that as a tree, that when you file a Freedom of Information Act request, that's your trunk and you get a document or maybe five documents. But, but if done correctly, the publishing of that UAP report will branch off into other cases, other avenues. It resulted in me filing over 50 Freedom of Information Act requests, trying to see what went in to those nine pages. We already see evidence that there's 144 cases that I can go after. It told the academic and scientific communities that this is a real mystery. That is the first time in history anything at an official level of locomotion has admitted that. And to me, that is, makes it a historic document. I was getting reports from people in Washington about how disappointing even the classified report was that Lou Elizondo, who had been head of the Advanced Aerial uh, Research Threat Identification Program in the Pentagon, he had been saying more on television about the observables of this phenomena that could not be any human What's important is that we have identified some very, very interesting anomalous um, type of aircraft, let's call them aircraft. Things that don't have um, any obvious flight surfaces, any obvious forms of propulsion, and maneuvering in ways um, that include extreme maneuverability beyond, uh, I would submit, the healthy G-forces of, uh, of a human or anything biological. And you can't have a human in any kind of an aircraft that goes 12,000 miles an hour and does a 90-minute corner turn in the sky. Not physically possible for humans. 
And Lou Elizondo has been saying this now for three or four months. Whether you're a huge fan of Luis Elizondo or whether you doubt everything that he says, no one can hide the, from the fact that there's a lot of mystery and a lot of intrigue about him as essentially a character in this story. That controversy fuels an awful lot of speculation. You can't help but start asking questions on why is a counterintelligence agent who was formerly with the Department of Defense, who has a decade upon decade long history of covering up UFOs, now out in the open saying he worked on a UFO project and we need to know more of the truth. Sadly, we just don't have the evidence to say either way. Hey, Roger, this is Jimmy. I've got great news. I finally chased down Lou, and he agrees with us that this is too important of a picture. He's got to get his message out, and he is ready to go. Uh, give me a call back when you can, and we'll discuss the details. Uh, allow me for, for a brief moment uh, to explain my position and why I've decided to to, to do in particularly this this interview. Um, I'm doing it because I have two daughters. I'm doing it because I'm a father, because I'm a citizen. Uh, I, 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 I'm a patriot, I'm a husband, uh, and and I'm trying to continue the, the mission that I was given so many years ago uh, with the Department of Defense. Um, as, 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 as crazy as may sound, um, I was never relieved of my obligations. The work that I do, much of it is behind the scenes. And I'm not sure people appreciate the work that folks like Chris Mellon and myself are doing and my colleagues uh, behind the scenes because it's it's a bit like a submarine uh, that's under the ocean. Um, you don't see it until you see it. My colleagues and I have committed our, our lives to this and our livelihood to this. Um, this isn't a game, this isn't a hobby, this isn't an interest. You know, this is, this is, this is real. This has been a very difficult journey for me. Uh, it's a journey that I wouldn't, wouldn't recommend any of my friends to take. Certainly no one that I care about or love um, to take. It's, it's been very difficult, um, but I'll tell you, it's also been worse for other people. And uh, I'm certainly not gonna complain because uh, I got out relatively unscathed. Um, yeah, I've, my, my people are attacking my credibility and, and, and whatnot, but at the end of the day, you know, I, I, uh, I'm still here. And that's not necessarily true for some other people. This topic has been fraught with controversy. And I think uh, some people have had, really had to pay a, a significant price. Um, hopefully some of those heroes will be able to step out of the shadows here soon. Uh, and, and we can stand shoulder to shoulder and have a more comprehensive conversation with the American people. I was, I was one of those quote unquote men in black, I guess. Um, but I, I realize it's probably better now to be, you know, as one of my colleagues says, you know, I'd rather be known as the men, men in white, um, you know, truth, uh, bringing, bringing truth to the topic. Um, you know, I, I still hold myself accountable. I, I still feel, if you want to know how, how Lou Elizondo feels, I still feel incredibly guilty. I feel incredibly guilty that, that um, I didn't have this conversation sooner. Imagine for one moment, if, if, if it turns out that the U.S. government really was and has been continuing to be involved in this topic uh, and uh, has, has kept that secret, not only from the American people, which is bad enough, but even kept it from itself, right? People who, who are paid to be in the know, people that run special access programs, people that are charged with oversight of, the, of these things. And you have a, 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 a major defense contractor who uh, had an unfair advantage because they were asked to look at exotic material potentially. Uh, I'm not going to go into origins here, but just say hypothetically, we're able to look at uh, some, some interesting material uh, while other defense industry partners um, weren't given that same access, right? And so now this defense partner uh, comes up with all sorts of innovations and, you know, is a, is a multi-billion dollar company. Meanwhile, these other companies may have gone bankrupt, right? And, and people's lost 
lost their jobs and livelihoods, um, all because you know one company was given access uh, or privy to information while while another one wasn't. The U.S. government in the past has been involved in some pretty terrible things uh, against the American people that were not at the interests of the American people, and and the the American government had to be held accountable for that. So now comes the hard part. Um, now that we have acknowledgement, and I think we are now at the point as as a nation between our elected officials in Congress, between uh, our senior uh, officials in, in the executive branch, and even former presidents, former directors of CIA, former directors of national intelligence. I think the national conversation has begun. And I think we have now, we have now officially acknowledged the reality of this. Um, what we haven't done yet is have a complete and truthful conversation about the American people of how long we've known about it. We now know our government has acknowledged the reality of this, uh, that this phenomenon exists. Whatever it is, it is real. We have now the official establishment of a UAP task force. You have the release of three videos being acknowledged by the government as being official, authentic videos. And furthermore, that they depict some sort of UAP, unidentified aerial phenomenon. You have classified briefings being provided to Congress. You have presidents now being brought into the loop of this. You have senators like Marco Rubio uh, on both sides. And, and of course, my, my very, very dear friend, Senator Harry Reid, coming out and joining hands and saying, this is a topic that we need to discuss. The fact that there are things that are operating in our controlled U.S. airspace that we have no idea what they are. We have no idea how they work. We have no idea the origins or the intent or full capabilities or, or anything else. I think at some point, uh, we will be faced with the with the eminent reality that either we are alone or that we're not alone. And I think it's looking more and more likely that we're probably not alone. One night I was driving with Tony Schiavone. We were down in Georgia. I had left the WWF and I was with WCW and we were coming back from somewhere in Georgia in the middle of the night. Something occurred in the Georgia skies that night when we were driving home late that we both turned to each other in the car and we both said, what in the hell was that? And it was a massive light form that occurred in the sky and Tony and I, we weren't drunk or anything of that nature. We couldn't figure out what it was, and today I still don't know what it was, but I didn't have the means or the wherewithal at that time to at all be able to pursue or attempt to learn what it was. It's today a simple memory. As governor, he made money on the sun. That's right for your old man, you little bastard! As a foul-mouthed WWE referee, Ventura created the modern anti-establishment, anti-media, anti-career politician. As we shock the world! Ventura's win was so shocking that Donald Trump came to Minnesota to see for himself. And the American dream lives on in Minnesota as we shock the world! After I won the election, I was contacted by the Central Intelligence Agency, and they asked if I would meet with 21 of them in the bowels of the Capitol, and I said, sure. Uh, they put me in a chair at the end of the room, and they were half circled around me, and they wanted to know how I won the election. Their job is to gather intelligence, and apparently nobody saw me coming. And so they figured it was better to learn of it after the fact and so they could be maybe prepared next time. Now, the part that got me a little is, what are they preparing for? Are they preparing for the fact that their intelligence gathering was that bad that they didn't see me coming? Or are they preparing for the fact now to be in position so that nothing like me can ever happen again? And I kind of think it's the latter. He's crazy. He's a conspiracy theorist. He, they marginalize you is what they try to do. And they do that, and, and to do that to me is tougher for him because I'm an elected governor. He served the least amount of time. They wouldn't even let him do one term. That showed his greatness. I believe he had more enemies within our own government than, than all of the 
you know, the Russians and all them combined. He was more hated within our own government. I believe that today. What truly got me involved in questioning things was the murder of John F. Kennedy. I read many things that the public was unaware of and didn't know. If they'll lie to you or they'll deceive you about something as important as what that turned out to be, which was a coup d'etat, for lack of any better term for it, a change in our government, if they will lie over that, then what other things do they keep from the regular people? If Lee Harvey Oswald was who they told us he was, a little disgruntled lone nut who was angry at Kennedy and wanted notoriety, so he decided to kill the president, why would there be need to lock up anything? The National Archives is expected to release thousands of previously secret files on the 1963 assassination of President John F. Kennedy. This time, they still have not been released, but when they are, experts say they could reveal more of what the FBI and CIA knew. When President Donald Trump took office, a very interesting event unfolded, and that was a sitting U.S. president saying, we're going to declassify everything on the JFK assassination. Tonight, President Trump said he is clearing the way for the rest of the files. The only exception, he says, will be the names and addresses of people who are still alive. The president said he's making the decision to put any and all conspiracy theories to rest. President Trump tonight, though, did not say when he will allow the release of those remaining documents. That effort by him, even though it was just a tweet, essentially set in motion the declassification of records on the JFK assassination. And although they declassified a ton, there are still thousands that they told the president, no, we are not going to declassify it. What made the man who prided himself on shaking up the swamp and, and draining it and turning everything upside down, what made him go, you guys are right, I'll support that. So it really makes you wonder how much power does a president really have? How much knowledge do they really have? There's a lot of evidence to indicate people who very well could be involved, but without the release of all documents, and because 60 years have now gone by, and everyone who was involved probably today is certainly dead. If what they tell you is the truth, there is no need to lock up anything and withhold it from public. Why would there be? So there's still a lot of I would say, material, secrets, truth behind the JFK assassination that has yet to be revealed. There's a lot of theories floating around. There's a lot of people who claim to know why he was assassinated. In some instances, they'll even combine conspiracy theories and say JFK wanted to declassify UFO documents, so ergo he was assassinated by the intelligence community. Of course, there's no strong evidence to support that. Do I have the documents to prove? No. Have I talked with people who were firsthand when Kennedy was assassinated and what they told me? Yes. Apparently, as it's been explained to me, Dulles actually said to somebody, I have clear authority to assassinate the President of the United States if he threatens our national security having to do with extraterrestrial and UFOs. We now have documents that show that John F. Kennedy, only a few days before the assassination in Dallas, had written a memo request to the director of the CIA with CCs to other people, and it was about he was ordering that the United States collaborate with Russia to go to the moon. I think that the JFK assassination is a metaphor for all history when it comes to the United States. That UFOs and ETs from World War II on became the separation point of the entire planet. Those who would know the truth, small, unable to talk or they would be killed and death was used to make sure 
that the people on the inside knew if you tell anyone, you will die. President Kennedy made so many enemies when he was in office. You probably have at least five entities who could have did it and who could have joined together to do it and who may have done it. We got St. John Hunt, the son of the infamous E. Howard Hunt of CIA Watergate fame, confessed to knowing about the JFK killing on his deathbed to his son on film. We aired that film. I thought there would be headlines across America the next day. E. Howard Hunt admits to involvement in the killing of JFK, because this is a well-known man. I think it's essential to refocus on what this information consists of. What is important in the story is that we backtrack the chain of command there wasn't one word in the mainstream media. There wasn't one word that it was even talked about that E. Howard Hunt confessed to a role in the killing of John Kennedy. He said it was called the big event and he named all the people that were involved. So if you choose to believe E. Howard Hunt, he will tell you who everybody was and, it, and he finished it off with the initials LBJ. Internecine warfare. John F. Kennedy's administration clearly was being torn apart by all of these undercurrents of a black world. When you look at the history of the intelligence community and the different agencies and what their mission statements are and what the scope of their work is, you realize that a lot of them were essentially doing many of the same things without the knowledge of the other. It seems that it, it became very territorial. There are even instances where, especially with the mind control experiments of the CIA, that they learn about the military research that was going on. And what did they do? They started stealing the research. They started realizing that even though the military originally began to uh, figure out how to defend against mind control techniques that were being developed by the Soviets, the CIA finds a way to start extracting that information in, into their own uh, vaults, so to speak, and then realizing, okay, this can not only be for defensive, it can be offensive. So then they started their own research without the knowledge of uh, anyone else. And so you see a lot of that territorial nature when it comes to research, when it comes to essentially stealing intelligence from each other. Uh, it's something that has gone on for decades and I'm sure still goes on today. Lieutenant Colonel Philip J. Corso, he said, Linda, our greatest problem was the internecine warfare that existed between military branches. So nothing has changed. It's just gotten deeper, blacker, and more and more encompassing and impactful on everything that is happening in the United States. I think when it comes to secrecy, the smartest move, and what I would bet that they've done, is created a segmented layer of the US government and the intelligence community to handle the secrets that need to be kept in perpetuity. Some of those have leaked out over time. Some of those we may never know. Look at the Manhattan Project. There were over 100,000 people involved in the Manhattan Project, and yet because it's so compartmentalized, which is how government gets away with things, they compartmentalize everything. The left hand don't know what the right hand's doing. Nothing was leaked until the bomb actually hit in Japan. And then the world knew of this power we had created that will haunt us to mankind's very end. Is it possible that you could have a level of secrecy in our world that caused a certain segment of our civilization to, in a sense, break away? What would be the cosmology of these people? They would have science that would be off limits. They would have an understanding of the world and of us in the universe that the rest of us 
uh, poor slobs out there would not have, and, and maybe even interactions with these other beings. And I, I ended up calling it a breakaway civilization. They're segmented out. They're not the ones that they are the elected officials. They're not the ones that are sitting in the White House. They're not the ones that are sitting in front of television cameras answering the question. It's like, let's say Roswell was real. So we recovered exotic, non-human technology and studied it in deep, black budget, uh, ultra-classified special access programs. And, and what if in those special access programs, our scientists developed um, some insight scientifically in terms of propulsion or in terms of energy? So you would have a, a breakthrough in terms of energy, you'd have a breakthrough in terms of maybe other things. And those scientists would then be off to the races. They, they have this secret, which would be classified and literally off limits to anyone in the outside who might stumble across it and would not be permitted to pursue it. What I've come to see in these uh, interactions with UAPs is that it's technology way beyond the, the typical person's comprehension. It's perhaps, as some believe, a thousand years in advance of, of what we know in, in our culture today. As they would develop and isolate and control, NSA and CIA, they didn't want to go out and get their hands dirty. So it's my understanding the Defense Intelligence Agency gets created to be the body whose exclusive power will be if something crashes, if some being shows up, if something's happening, it'll be the DIA that will be assigned to go out into the world and do the investigations and bring back the material. Could we have our own little flying saucers, which we've heard about, rumors, you know, our own alien reproduction vehicles? When the government has a weapon that you know about, you can rest assured they've probably had it for at least a decade, if not more. I would say there are certainly weapons we have today that many people probably are unaware we have. For example, if you, if you came up with an energy solution that surpassed petroleum, that might not necessarily be allowed, literally allowed to come out. Why? Well, we all know the story of what happened to Nikola Tesla. Tesla discovered what's called free energy, that there's energy all around us, and that if we harness this free energy, we would have no need anymore to have cars or fuel cars. In other words, Tesla could put the fossil fuel business out of business. The government came, on, came in and physically confiscated all of his work so that therefore it would not be seen by the public. I spent a good deal of time examining one by one the papers, the books, but I was particularly looking for something which would uh, just be evidence of a secret weapon, which I was reminded by the agents, the two agents who were present during the entire time, uh, was uh, a matter of concern to the United States. Yeah, it would be too transformative, it would be too disruptive. The, the entire United States geopolitical posture worldwide relies on what we call the petrodollar. It relies on domination of locations of petroleum around the world, the extraction, the distribution, and connecting that to our financial system. And moving off of that, that's disruptive. And that those, those breakthroughs would not necessarily be released to the rest of the world because they'd be classified. And it really paints the picture on Will we ever get the absolute truth on anything? Because I don't think there's one agency or entity that ultimately knows the entire truth. And maybe that is by, by design. If you keep all this stuff fractured and segmented within the intelligence community, and yes, they may double up on the work periodically, they're still kind of without the full picture. That was the idea of a breakaway civilization. I've always considered it a hypothesis or an idea, a possibility. Um, in search of proof. And I've been looking for that proof ever since. And I think, you know, there's indications, there's evidence that, yeah, it's probably an idea that's got some merit to it. 
And that could be a peek at that segmented layer of secrecy. We only have the mercy of when they, the powers that be, want to actually tell us. Uh, it is now very clear that the arguments, the power conflicts, between now 17 intel agencies is what Lou Elizondo ran up against like a buzzsaw when he started trying to say, yes, there are non-humans, and yes, I work for ATIP, and then pulled back on non-humans and said, well, there are unusual phenomena. And the Pentagon chooses to disparage him. Well, from my perspective, the abductee is a person whose life has become an unanswered question. I don't think we know what has happened to us. There's never been any serious effort made to find out. There is an ample amount of physical evidence. It's not simply all in the mind. But what was it? Uh, when I was working with Dr. Roger Lear in the late 90s uh, with the help of Dr. William Mallow, who was the director of material science at Southwest Research in San Antonio, Texas, we studied a number of objects that were taken out of people. Most of these were unremarkable. They were pieces of magnetite or meteor, meteoric iron that had been magnetized and these objects were encased in epidermal tissue, but buried deep inside their muscles. The human body does not have the genetic encoding to do that. Therefore, it was not natural. But what were they doing there? And the memories of these people were of having close encounters. I woke up and I saw these two gray figures in my room, coming from the window towards me, kind of gliding, not really walking. And my first instinct was, stop, don't come any closer. Don't touch me, don't kill me, you know? I, I mean, it was just sheer terror, straight out. Something happened, and then I wasn't scared anymore. One of them had a black box about the size of a shoebox, maybe, kind of the shape of a shoebox. And it kind of drifted over to me. I said, can I have it? And he said, no, you can't have it. But when you see it again, you'll know what to do. The abduction experience is very challenging on a whole lot of different levels. At first, I thought I was going insane. And I had, uh, I took, I went to my doctor and I took a test, an MRI scan to see if I had something wrong with my brain a temp test for temporal lobe epilepsy to see if I was prone to seizures, and a battery of psychological tests that showed me to be a normal person under stress. And this left me grasping at straws, facing the fact that I really had encountered the unknown, and it had a very powerful effect, and it was absolutely terrifying. I recall standing at the kitchen window and looking out the kitchen window to the pump house and swimming pool area, and I saw a light in the pump house. The light was a different color. It was more of a whitish light instead of that yellow incandescent bulb that was in there. It just didn't, wasn't quite right. I went out there, uh, looked around the backyard, didn't see anything. I did find my dog under my dad's ladder truck, but she would not come out, and I'm like, fine, stay there, I don't care. Went to the garage, and as I Looked around in the garage. I, I didn't see anyone, but I suddenly felt like I was on fire. And I could feel every molecule of my body vibrate individually. 
I know, I don't know how to describe it. As I, and I thought, I felt like it was on fire and I thought, I have to get out of here right now. And I ran to the door. And as I got in the doorway, I was hit right here by a light. It spread through my legs. It spread through my arms. I could not move. Time stopped, literally. And I felt like I was individually vibrating a million molecules that made up me and I could feel every single one of them. I I don't know how long I was like that. I don't think I could have lasted more than a, a few seconds, but it felt like an eternity at that moment. I think the first thing that has to be done is we mustn't connect the dots in the sense that it's very easy to decide that this is one thing or another. Holding on to the question is our great strength, I think. Uh, That's what kept me sane in the early days when I was really struggling with this. Uh, People wanted to tell me they were evil aliens and they wanted to tell me there were this and that and the other thing. And I finally just called a halt to all of this, what I felt was psychological interference with, with my stability and said, look, you don't know. You tell me it's these evil reptilians, where are they? Show me one. And they couldn't do it. And I decided that staying with the question is the healthy way to do this. But right now, we don't know. We do know that something very strange is happening. It has every, there's every indication that this is something, some kind of an approach to mankind and this planet from some other intelligent entity that is not human. When the brightness faded, I was left out in the door, out in the doorway, out on the patio, and I could not move, but I could move my eyes. But my vision was totally wrecked. It was like a million people took my picture all at the same time with flash bulbs, and I just had all these white spots in my vision, and I saw movement out in front of me. And I thought it was kids. I thought there were six kids in my mom's backyard, and I thought, what the hell are all these kids doing in my mom's yard? What, you know, and, but then I realized they don't quite look like kids. And I noticed that they had come from different areas in the yard, and they all kind of moved together and formed this line. And then they rolled, kind of slid or glided down across and in front of me. And that's when I saw this thing this egg-shaped craft. Uh, And and I didn't want to look at it. As soon as I saw it, I was like, (gasps) you know, I didn't want to look at it, but then I didn't not want to look at it because I needed to know where it was in relationship to me at all times, you know, because it was scaring me. And I was trapped, I stuck, I couldn't move. At around that time, I felt something pull down on my shoulders and I felt like somebody took a hot, knitting needle and shoved it in my ear, this one, all the way into the middle of my head. And I wanted to scream, but I couldn't. And I tell everyone now, when that happened, I died that night and the new Debbie was born. Because from that point on in my life, I was different. The question of whether or not abductees are selected has to remain open, but Maybe there are even genetic reasons for the selection. Maybe there are, like, for example, uh, I had sexual material taken from me on my first close encounter experience. I had it taken again in another way about six months later. Uh, And so if they're taking sexual material, that implies that there's some kind of sampling process going on, that they're selecting people that they, specific people that they want w- want to select because they're building some kind of a model of the species. Or maybe, maybe they're even seeding us on another planet. I don't know what they may be capable of. So I can't answer the question definitively, but I can say it sure looks like that. I was excited to be a mother because it's all I ever wanted. I went to the doctor. The doctor confirmed my pregnancy. I remember falling asleep on the couch one night and I remember laying there on the couch with my back to the TV and I I felt something 
stroke my spine, my shoulder down. You know, the next thing I remember is waking up in my niece's bed and it's morning. And all like I think of was my baby. There's something wrong. And I went to the restroom to make sure everything was all right. And um, everything was fine, but I couldn't shake this feeling. Something was not right. So when I told my best friend, she was there that night when the weird lights happened. Um, she, she said, come with me to Planned Parenthood. You can get a free pregnancy test there. Nobody will ask you any questions and then you'll shut up. And I remember waiting out in the waiting room after the, the test and the lady came back out and she said, well, your test is negative, but if you don't have your period in another week, you need to see your family physician. And it's, all I heard was the word negative and I, I was just out of it at that point. Could have, you know, it was like I got hit here by a brick. And um, we got a doctor's appointment and went back. Another pelvic exam, another test. The doctor says, come into my office, sits my mom and I down and he says, well, you're not pregnant. And I said, how is that even possible? You know, and he goes, well, sometimes these things happen. This is what he said, we see this. And he said, if I were you, I would just forget it ever happened. You're young, you'll have other children. Whether or not there's some kind of government locomotion behind the abductions themselves, military or some other type, if that has happened, then in my mind, it's like the plutonium experiments that were uh, carried out on people without their knowledge. And somebody's owed a lot for this. The people who were victimized by the plutonium experiments were eventually compensated and received a presidential apology. The goal was to understand the effects of radiation exposure on the human body. While most of the tests were ethical by any standards, some were unethical, not only by today's standards, but by the standards of the time in which they were conducted. They fail both the test of our national values and the test of humanity. If we were, have been subjected to something or given, something has been given permission to, to interfere with us and we weren't told, then we are owed something for that, for sure. Among other things, we are owed an apology and we're also owed the best possible explanation that can be given for what is happening to us. The government has deals with them and all this stuff. I don't know, maybe they do. I can only speak for myself and my own experience, you know? And I just know that uh, if we want the disclosure that we're waiting for, it's gonna have to be from us, the people who've had this experience. We all gotta band together, speak up, don't be ashamed, don't be afraid, and demand the truth that we're entitled to. I had two kids to raise. I could not afford to be crazy. <laughs> Times have changed. People's minds are open and I'm so glad to see it, you know. But I want, I want people to know who, uh, for every one person like me in the world, there's a hundred thousand that won't say anything. Even now, they're all, I think a lot of them my age. Younger people are more apt to speak it out and say it and, and say, I, I saw this and this is real, you know, but my people my age, it's not so easy. And so I want everyone to know that it's okay. You know, it's still hard for me to talk about it. And I still get embarrassed because I keep thinking to myself, I hear my voice and I think, Jesus Christ, I sound like a crazy person. At least I'm not so crazy that I don't realize that I sound like a crazy person. If I didn't think I was crazy, then I might need to be concerned. But I've come to realize that 
This world is not what you think it is. What you see right here and right now, this is one layer of the onion skin. And it's what our brains are made to be able to perceive. If this is contact of some kind with aliens or entities of some other sort that are not human, then the abductee experience is the future in all of its complexity, from the hard parts of it and the frightening parts of it and the parts of it we want nothing to do with, to the more sublime parts of it and the extraordinary journeys of spiritual growth and psychic growth and all growth on all sorts of different ways that we do very much want. The abductees are a sample of the future. We are all of us together, people from the future. Uh, there are future humans. Uh, in, in Christianity, they talk about the just humans made perfect that dwell at the throne of God. There's angels gathered in joyful assembly and just humans made perfect. These are, these are righteous humans, a more perfected version of future humanity. My worldview about our reality is largely derived from my study of mystical Christianity. I'm still on that path to recover those original teachings, and I realize now that those teachings didn't come from Egypt or Iran, Iraq, or, or the Middle East. They came from elsewhere. They, they came from beings that projected themselves into our reality in order to transform it into a place of greater light and greater love, and ultimately to connect us to these higher civilizations. People are starting to incorporate our understanding of extraterrestrials and UFOs or UAPs, and they're going back and they're looking at these original texts, the Bible, for example, and the Gnostic Gospels that, that talk about our interactions with celestial beings. And they, they talk about strange lights and craft like Ezekiel's vision. And we're readily able now to understand that these could be technological craft or they could be some form of an organic light craft, if you will. They don't go into a lot of detail about what they are, but now we're able to extrapolate and look back and say, hey, wait a minute. What they were experiencing thousands of years ago is the same thing that we're experiencing today. Our ultimate aim as human beings in many mystical traditions, especially the Christian tradition, is to attain perfection. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden were, were perfect light beings. They were not in flesh and blood form according to esoteric Christianity and Judaism. They were in a different form. Eden was a place of pure light, pure love. Human beings existed in an energetic state of being without flesh and blood bodies. Then we fell. And now we're, we find ourselves in this version of our bodies. And all of Jewish and Christian history is ultimately an answer to that fall and a quest to return to our original state of being as beings of pure light and pure love. We've entered a quantum age within the past few decades, assuredly. And what that means is that we're making a, a leap not only in technology, but also in consciousness. I defer people to NASA's high priest of technology, Dr. Uh, Dennis Bushnell, who for since the year 2000 has been the one that's been feeding most of your high technology companies the, the, the desire to create AI technologies for the US government, especially NASA. It, since 2000, he said in his presentations that it was 10,000 years ago that, that humans were agricultural based, we were hunter gatherers, and then we, we harnessed the power of nature, we subdued nature, we control ag agriculture, and we lived that way for several thousands of years, and then we entered the industrial age, where now we started introducing machines. Then we started in introducing information technology in the 1950s. Beginning in the 1990s and 2000s, we started to merge with artificial intelligence vis-a-vis -vis our phones and our computers and our addiction to, to these devices. And we're living that way for a time. And where NASA envisions this going, or certainly Dr. Bushnell envisions this going, is that humanity will ultimately become virtual beings. We will drop our physical existence altogether and enter into a virtual type of existence. The reason we want to do this, according to Bushnell and also the Department of Commerce and similar reports, is that we will be able to create wealth on a scale 
previously unimaginable. We will be able to create a new golden age, their term, where humans will be able to live for hundreds of years. We will solve all of our major scientific and medical problems. We will effectively be able to create a paradise on Earth. The trade-off is, of course, is that we will ultimately leave behind what is human about us uh, from our organic nature, as well as our spirituality. So this is where we're at right now, is looking at, well, what what is the opportunity cost here? Uh, yes, I can live for hundreds of years. Yes, I can create a, a, a replacement body for myself. Yes, I could have an IQ of at least a thousand. But if I have no soul, what what... What, what's that going to do for me? When you juxtapose humanity and where we are going and essentially how we are merging with machines, that we're now integrating our biological selves with mechanical extensions, how we're now bridging computer chips and circuitry with the human mind, the implications about that are absolutely frightening. The key to artificial intelligence is the software on board. And once that software on board can harness the power of these incredibly strong supercomputers and chips that are rapidly progressing. When you combine the two, you can have a thinking machine that will make decisions, that will make itself better, that can learn. It could live forever. Time is irrelevant. They're not gonna decay. You can program that machine to self-replicate, to essentially create clones of itself. I'm 99.9% .9 sure we don't wanna merge with AI. I leave it open 0.1% uh, based on uh, statements, Catholic teaching that, that essentially says, who are we to limit God's creativity? People were opposed to augmenting our body with eyeglasses. If God wanted you to see, he would have given you a decent set of eyes. Who are you to challenge God's authority? That was the argument. Now everybody wears glasses. And here we are today now augmenting the body with AI. We can replace all of our organs. We can augment our, our intelligence, vastly augment it with, with nanotechnology and link ourselves with AI that's gonna transform us. Just in the same way we were once energetic light beings and now take on physicality, we are now evolving. We're, we're changing our body and our agreement with our universe via this technology and entering into a new state of being, and many resist it. To us, we have the spirituality, whether we believe in God or whether we believe in meditating and a higher power or the earth is a God, whatever we believe, that's what makes us human. And many people think we lose that when we start getting into artificial intelligence. But essentially, all of that belief in us is programmed, whether it be from our mother or our father, or whether it be from a grandfather who raised us or whomever it is, we're essentially programmed to feel that way. We're, it's in our blood. Our DNA is programming, so to speak. So in the same respect, artificial intelligence, if you program it to understand love, it will. If you program it to destroy, it will. And when you look at that progression and where we've gone in the last couple of decades alone, it is staggering to see where we may end up. I believe AI needs to be regulated now. It may even be too late. I mean, Elon Musk is a, an advocate of AI, and he has remarked publicly that this is like we've summoned the demon. That's his term, and it's already out of the box, and it's running rampant. And that is a whole nother conversation. But when we, when we talk about sentient AI versus non-sentient AI, uh, first, let's understand the, the difference. When we talk about artificial intelligence, there's two types. There's weak AI and strong AI. Non-sentient or weak AI is what we're all familiar with. When we call customer service at the phone company, we're dealing with weak, uh, non-sentient AI. What is happening now is companies that make phones like Samsung are now creating replacement humans. These are non-sentient replacement humans. They look just like you and I. You, you would not be able to tell the difference between yourself and one of these non-sentient neons, as they're called. These replacement humans that are intended for customer service and, and things such as that. But it, it could be more nefarious than that. It could go beyond that. These non-sentient AI, they have no feelings. They have no self-motivation. No, they can't set intentions. They, they act smart, but they're really stupid because they can only do what they're programmed to do. That's in contrast to strong AI, which is sentient AI. This is when these neon beings that look like humans actually can take on physicality. They will cross over the glass 
They won't live behind the computer. They will actually cross over the glass and be walking amongst us. They will have their own self-motivation, their own intention. They will be seeking to fulfill their own goals that may or may not match the goals of their creator. This is the danger that AI will wake up and decide that, well, maybe humans are in the way, maybe humans can be useful for certain purposes, or maybe it's time for humans just to, to leave the planet. There will be a time where we can create a software that will convince a machine it is sentient. They're harnessing really powerful computers, but once they actually create the software to utilize it, there's a very big question that emerges, and that is, can a computer be sentient? Can it feel? Can it love? Can it understand what the feeling of a hug is? Because the moment we cross that line and teach a machine to learn, we need to teach it to stop. Because to a machine, time becomes irrelevant. And if you give it enough data, it will far surpass humanity, build something more explosive than we have ever built. It could reach farther in the universe than we can ever reach. The possibilities are endless, but also incredibly dangerous if not handled properly. We're entering a quantum realm. This technology is neither good nor bad, but it's both at the same time and more. And that's what we have to grasp here, is that this could ultimately be useful for humanity. This is all, in my view, what the book of Revelation warned about, that what it talks about an end time scenario where uh, a, a dragon engenders two beasts, one beast that gets everyone to worship the image of the beast and to take the mark of the beast, and the second beast, which is the Antichrist. I, I'm pretty sure that sentient AI is the Antichrist, that when that when those beings cross over the glass and take on physicality and have their own motivation and intentions, that will be the Antichrist. That will be the ultimate uh, final battle for humanity. And the purpose of the mark of the beast is to link you with the image of the beast, which appears to be some kind of a global technology that, that AI precisely fits, at, at least in our age. So very clearly what's happening is that we are beginning to worship the image of the beast. We're worshiping false images, fake human beings. Where it ties in for me to the extraterrestrial hypothesis is are we encountering essentially artificial intelligence in the sky? We look at the fact that we have artificial intelligence on Mars, but we're taking our machines, putting them on alien worlds in our solar system and exploring, trying to figure out what is out there. In time, we'll exit our solar system. Humanity will. We'll branch beyond it. It's just inevitable. That's where we're going. So the possibilities then with artificial intelligence and what you can do, and you combine that with the ability to clone, that brings up a whole new point of conversation about alien life, about where they could be in the universe, and whether or not they're coming here. The single most important discussion that I have had in my life and career up to this very point was December of 1999. It had started with a man at the World Bank got in touch with me and said, I would like to put together a meeting between you and a colleague of mine who works for the Defense Intelligence Agency. He is an analyst and his job is analyzing extraterrestrial biological entities. And he began by saying, I'm retiring after 23 years, and my job was to monitor and analyze the conflict of three extraterrestrial biological entity civilizations that have been terraforming and manipulating genetic material on this planet for at least 270 million years. And then over the next seven hours, he broke down tall blondes, reptilian humanoids, and the greys. He said the greys were largely artificial intelligence. A lot was unknown about the progenitor of the greys. The blondes were in many, many star solar systems in the Milky Way galaxy. That the reptilians were here first. And that the reptilians claim Earth as their own. 
But the blondes want to be able to do laboratory experiments on Earth as well, and so do the greys. Three-way conflict. The blondes have been trying to annihilate the reptilians. The reptilians have been trying to annihilate the blondes. The greys have sometimes taken sides. Other times, they do their own independent thing. But he said, what we have come to learn is why I wanted to do this meeting with you. Because I got a call that said, you have to get Linda Moulton Howe's new book. She has a 106-page chapter about the resurrection technology that we have never wanted anyone to know anything about it that I and others in the DIA had closed down any discovery of this, ever. And I said, well, my sources are the people in the human abduction syndrome. He said, I realize we underestimate what the non-humans are doing with people. And then he talked to me about how the reptilians and the blondes fight. He said, the blondes make reptilian containers and they have the ability to put their consciousness and their life force into the reptilian container. The reptilians began to catch on to what the blondes were doing and they started making blonde containers and putting their reptilian consciousness. And then the greys saw what the blondes and the reptilians were doing, and the greys created blondes and reptilians that they would move into. And he said, Linda, you cannot tell the players on this planet without very sophisticated technology. He said, over time, in the analysis that he did, that the biggest fight seemed to be over territory. And the biggest fight seemed to be over what to do or not to do with one of the latest genetic experiments, Homo sapiens sapiens. And all three of those extraterrestrial groups want to do laboratory experiments here. They want the other two to go away. And he said to me, what I think and why I'm talking to you and why I sought you out. I frankly think that if the whole world knew the whole truth that I'm talking to you today, it would probably create a dent in the ability of those three extraterrestrial civilizations to manipulate humans. You got a situation where the militaries of the world, and especially the United States military, encountered, learned about the reality of other beings that are here. That's that's what happened. Beings that that aren't like us, that are advanced, right, in many ways, and and in which they probably didn't really know the motivations. There's a lot of unknowns. So the start of the secrecy, it's not that difficult to understand because first of all, the secret becomes profitable. Like it becomes profitable and powerful because you have knowledge and you have the future in your hands there. Because if you're studying the tech, you're studying these beings, you're learning things, it gives you advantages over your adversaries in the world, like all of that. Like you're not gonna wanna stop that little gravy train. But also the compartmentalization, the secrecy, I've said for years, like it's it's like one of many knives in the back of the old fashioned American Republic. The American Republic was like, you know, like when Caesar was murdered by all the senators, they just got him. Uh, it's kind of what happened to the American Republic. Lots of knives in the back, lots of them. And um, one of them is UFO secrecy. And what it did is it created a series of 
what I call legal illegality, a series of laws that are not really legal, they're not really constitutional. After, after all, if, like, if you gotta pay for all of this research and development on this stuff, and you can't tell Congress about it, well, Congress is supposed to know about it, but they can't. So you're, you're creating an extra constitutional system and, and it's not difficult to justify, but it's still illegal. It's still, it's still the destruction of this beautiful dream that was the American Republic, a beautiful dream, you know? And it's been, it's just like a knife in the back. And all the models that the United States turned on other nations in terms of color revolutions and so forth, which the United States intelligence community was absolute expert at. You, you know, you set up an NGO in Ukraine or in Kyrgyzstan or Bosnia or wherever, and you throw a couple of billion dollars and you just destroy the society. And then you create a revolution. But well, we're seeing that happening here. I mean, it's happening in the United States. Like our invention, our diabolical invention is, is being turned on ourselves now. You know, poetic justice in a way. But uh, so I don't know. I mean, are we even able any longer in an age where we're training an entire new generation to rely on Alexa and Google Echo for all of their answers. Don't bother researching. Get your authoritative answer from Google slash YouTube. They'll tell you. The Atlantic Council over at Facebook. All of these groups that are guiding people into pre, pre-masticated, pre-chewed solutions. We'll chew your food for you, baby bird. That's our world now. And so we're, we're taking, we're just continuing this process of, of taking the ability to make intelligent decisions away from people so they, they can't even figure this stuff out on their own. We always say, and I'm, I do say this, we want the truth. The problem with the truth is, I think the truth might be terrifying. And, and in our own lives, I think we actually don't really want truth. Like we tell ourselves that. But when you get into real truths, deep truths, whether it's about yourself or about things around you. Uh, those are very unsettling. Um, so I think that there could be some unsettling truths. And that doesn't mean like we should all be afraid of the future. Y- you can't avoid it. The closer this gets to us, the more provocative it's going to feel. And the more we are going to grasp at straws trying to figure out what it is. I think that there is an extraordinary future available to us And it's based on a statement made by Colonel Philip Corso. He describes a moment where he was being asked by these entities to turn off some radars at White Sands so that they could safely leave. He then asked, what's in it for us? The answer was, a new world if you can take it. That means if you can Rest it out of our hands because we're not giving you things that will disempower you if you can take it, meaning if you can bear it, if you can bear to see the whole paradigm that you have built up of reality thrown aside and that there is a whole new level of consciousness out there waiting for us to enter. Right now, we're up against very powerful evolutionary forces. In evolutionary biology, they talk about a concept called punctuated equilibrium. What this essentially states is that once a species enters or appears in the fossil record, it stays in a place of stasis. If change happens, it, it happens abruptly in a punctuated form, and it causes a split where the species doesn't transform, it literally splits into two different species. And that's where we're at right now. We're we're at this moment of rapid change and acceleration where we're merging with AI, where we risk ultimately splitting into two completely different species, those who merge with AI and those who remain organic. If there is a divine field that is responsible for all of the timelines, all of the universes, all of the dimensions that can be infinite as Roger Penrose has written and goes on in infinite cycles of time. If we knew that what the divine field's goal has always been 
is for every quantum energy packet called a soul to leave the divine field, the, th the thought that dwells in the light. And it sends out quantum energy packets in inorganic, organic, none of us know the parameters of consciousness in, in its totality. But maybe the whole reason for all of it is to see if every soul would choose on its own at some point in infinity, would reject black, reject evil, reject hate, reject war, and return to the divine field, the thought that dwells in the light. And then it would all disappear. If that were the large truth, then the consciousness of every human being on planet Earth right now, this hour, this second, if all of a sudden everybody is told the same truth, that is the revolution we are waiting for. There are only a very few things that might have the ability to shock our world into a better place. Because right now, like, we're, we're on a train on a track that's... I, I don't like the destination up ahead. What's the destination? Here it is. The destination is a global system in which humanity becomes one big, giant ant farm. 24-7 surveillance, 5G, 6G technology, smart devices all over the place, no privacy for the rest of all time. Not for you, not for your kids, not for your grandchildren, not ever. A regimented society, propagandized 24-7 all the time. And the only way really I can see stopping it is a mass awakening. So that people realize like, what's, what's happening? And, and the only way that's gonna happen is that people have a massive lie exposed to them. Like, here it is, you've been lied to on this scale for an entire human lifetime or more in which everyone just says, oh my dear God, what has happened? Our political institutions, our media, our everything, everything that we believed in has been shown to be one great long con. I mean, let's face it, we're in an era now where you're not supposed to believe in conspiracy theories. A phrase, by the way, that actually was invented, as far as we can tell, by the CIA in a 1967 document meant to disable the JFK alternate theories at the time. They actually created the phrase conspiracy theory. But anyway, we're now in an era where you're not supposed to believe in conspiracy theories, but yet here comes the UFO conspiracy theory, the true mother of all conspiracy theories. What's bigger than that? Really nothing. And if, if that were fully to be exposed in all of its like diabolical, like web of lies, I often wonder, maybe this would be the one truth that could actually be like that sledgehammer to smash that wall. If it wrecks the government's yay, because how's that working for you right now? Not really good, right? When I see how the world is run today, how governments run the world, doesn't seem like it's not how it's supposed to be. It can be so much better. You know, humans are the only species on earth that require money to survive. It's not supposed to be that way. There's a better way. And I, I just want people who've had these experiences, don't be afraid to speak up and speak out because the government knows more than they're saying, and they don't want you to know. And the one thing that we can't lose sight of is the government is ours. That is something that gets lost in the conversation. I think that society feels that we work for the government. <laughs> They actually have this feeling, this vibe, and this intimidation. It's the opposite. 
And if we want information, if we want action, it's us that does it. The government's not going to do it for us. To expect disclosure to come from the government for whatever reason, it'll never happen. It will never happen. Part of my perspective is developed from the book of Revelation. And remember, the good guys win. The, the light wins. A new golden age manifests, a thousand years of peace. And that's what's at stake here. And so we have to be willing to say, look, I'm going to give this gift of disclosure to my children, my grandchildren, and all future humanity. Maybe we should think about organizing and getting down to Washington and stating on the steps of, of the Capitol building, what is it that we're concerned about? Right there at the Lincoln Memorial, right there at the, at the mirror pools, and, and get together like all other movements in the past happened. And that's, the media is going to be there. They, they're, they're interested in this. Could it happen? Well, you know what? You have to try. In the last few years, with the amount of media publicity to UFOs and UAPs and the stories that have come out, there truly has been the birth of this disclosure movement, this push to get the United States government to tell the truth finally. If we don't stand up right now and demand that this, this knowledge and this information be made public, it may never be. Like a true deep disclosure that gets out of the control of the managers of our culture, that's, that's a hope. That's, that's not a sure thing that's gonna fix us. But I think if we want something that's going to have a chance, like that's a pretty good one. That might be the best chance. Today, are we at a crossroads? Yeah, we are, which is a crossroads that is no different than been going on for centuries and centuries. Religious beliefs and scientific beliefs. We have to face the fact that a whole new world is waiting for us. A new level of consciousness is opening up. And we're ready. We are ready. This is the most critical time on the Earth. If in the next 10 years, this headline has not broken, I don't think humanity will survive. Think it's the time for this stuff to come out now? Yep. I am 100% sure. And uh, every person I know who's had the weird experiences I've had has been walking around saying something is coming. Something big is going to happen in our lifetime, and we need to be ready because we have something to do with it. But I always had faith that when it was my time, the universe would make sure that I would be where I needed to be. And here I am with you.